physical um you know recreation and a physical salvation it doesn't save us from this world he saves us with this world forever um so we looked at how the, the christian idea of hope is very unique it's beautiful it's personal and it's concrete and it's all grounded in this idea of the resurrection of christ but weeks two and three you'll notice is the comfort is the peace we're kind of going we, we're trying to make in a good way is christianity desirable would you want it to be true? Like, it, does it offer you resources? Does it offer you something around comfort and peace and, and hope that maybe other worldviews and uh, don't? But obviously, you don't choose to become a Christian because it's desirable alone. As Andrew's just helpfully said, you, you need to know, well, is it true? So we've been kind of preparing for the last week, which is like, okay, we've tried to deal with some philosophical stuff. We've tried to deal with, you know, what what, what, are the, what does Christianity have to offer against the other worldviews? And now we're saying, well, let's have a look if it's true. So that's where we've got to. And as ever, we just hope it provides you some stimulating thoughts, even if you disagree, and a safe place, whether you call yourself a Christian, a struggling Christian, a non-believer, an atheist, an agnostic, to say, I want to ask some questions where I'm not going to be judged and swarmed on, or I'm not going to be like demonized. And it's not, you know, any, you know, any question, please, we want to provide that space. So thanks for coming. Hopefully that gives you a bit of a feel for the last few weeks and last week. Back to you, Andrew. Great, Steve. Thank you very much. So you'll actually be able to quiz Steve a little bit more on, on, on what he's been talking about at the end of tonight. So let me just give you a couple of more housekeeping tips. So we are going to record tonight, but don't worry, only the, the slides you're seeing and the person who is speaking is being recorded and, and we're going to stop recording at the Q&A section. So it's just kind of the talk and the two, the personal story in the talk that's being recorded. So I am going to now introduce Isaac. So Isaac, um, it, it's, it's good to have you here. Can I ask you to introduce yourself and, and then get straight stuck into your personal story? Yeah, super stuff. So hi, my name is Isaac, actually. Uh, luckily enough to be the housemate of Andrew as well. So we're in different rooms, but uh, studying science. I'm second year at UCD. Uh, and yeah, we just love to just take just a couple minutes just to talk about my story. You know, obviously, uh, it's been happening before. I, I, I'm privileged to be able to tell you my story of why I do believe. So just a bit of context. I have actually grown up in a Christian household. So we went to church as a kid. I, I, I read the Bible growing up. So the idea of faith actually was never that foreign a concept. Uh, and so as I've kind of like grown up as, as a Christian per se, I don't really have like a specific moment, I guess, where I would say I wasn't a Christian and then I became a Christian. Rather, it was more of a, a gradual process. Uh, it's a bit like, you know, if you were building a wall and you start by laying uh, down bricks and then you just keep laying down and then suddenly you have a wall. You don't really know when it goes from a pile of bricks to a wall, but at some point it just is. And it's kind of like that. As I've gone through lots of smaller experiences, I look back and think, actually, you know what? I, I realized that my faith is then suddenly my own faith, independent of, of the world I grew up in. And one very significant uh, experience, which I'd like to just talk about briefly, was actually my, my last year of school. Uh, and just a little bit more context. So I come from a family of a lot of overachievers, whether that's uncles, aunts, cousins, everyone excels. And so the the, the message that I was projected, and it wasn't projected, but that's the way I interpreted it, was that to be of worth or to be valuable or whatever you want to what, whatever you want to say is you needed to excel at something you needed to have a thing which you were really really good at and through success is how you were able to get validation from the family and that works if you're if you're good at stuff but actually I'm a bit of an average joke uh, I can throw my hand at a few things but I never really excelled at everything never found my thing and so obviously that always caused a lot of insecurity in myself but going into my final year of school, I decided that was going to change. And I was going to pick three things that I was going to excel at. Number one, I was going to be head boy. No one in the cousins had ever done that before. Number two was I was going to be the, the starting hooker for the senior cup rugby team. And number three was that I was going to be the, the best Christian, whatever that means. It feels weird even saying it now, but the best Christian as well. Uh, suffice to say, I didn't get any of it. Uh, I didn't get head boy, didn't even get deputy or the other deputy head boy. So. To totally failed that one I sat on the bench the entire season behind a very small hooker and 
I also found myself in in a cycle of kind of like repetitive sin where I was just so ashamed of it. I couldn't talk to anyone. And so by the by that point, I was feeling like a bit of a bump. You know, these three things which I thought I was going to excel in, and then I just didn't get any of it. But uh, something changed. Something changed in the latter part of that year, and it was the Bible. It was, I was reading, I, I, you know, I've grown up in a Christian family, I've always read the Bible, but something happened and it was as if I was reading the Bible for the first time again and these pages were coming to life. And I'll just talk to you about three verses that really shook me as I read them. So number one was I read the book of Romans, it's in the New Testament, Romans chapter eight, verses 38. And it says, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And it just shook me. It, it's, it's saying that no matter what you've done, no matter where you are, high, low, wide, far, no matter how bad a sinner you are, no matter you know what you've done, that God loves you. And it just, it just shook me that this idea that actually God could still love me, even if I was messing up all the time. And if, if God could love me, then maybe I could be able to forgive myself as well. So suddenly this guilt was beginning to ease away. Number, the, number two, the other passage that really just kind of stuck out to me in a way, like I'd read it before, but it just kind of blew me away that latter part of my final year of school. It was in the book of Philippians. Uh, chapter three, and it's been written by this guy called Paul. He's actually written most of the New Testament. But in this passage, he's kind of talking about how if he wanted to like boast, he could outflex anyone. You know, he could outclaim anyone that, you know, whatever the topic, he, he was excelling at it. But then he says this, and this really shook me. He said, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. And he also said, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that is which is through faith in Christ. And again, that just blew me away. This idea that he's saying these, these things which the world says are amazing. He then says, actually, well, if you compare it to knowing Jesus, not only are they just you know, they don't stand up in comparison, but they're so wide in comparison that they're almost like negative. He says, I, con I consider them garbage, that it's a negative. You know, it's like, this is so good that I, I, I don't even care about that other stuff anymore. And then that blew me away because suddenly then it wasn't about the stuff I'd done or my achievements. It was actually about knowing God and knowing his achievements, knowing, knowing the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, which we're going to be talking about later. That actually my identity didn't have to be found in myself anymore, even when, you know, I kept failing and these three pillars, which I thought I was going to build my life on, then go away. Well, then who am I? Well, I, I know Jesus. And that then suddenly was the most important thing. And it, it again, just really reshifted my whole worldview. And then finally, I read a verse uh, in the book of Romans again. I was in chapter eight and it was verse 28. And it says this, it says, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And as I read that, it says that, that, that God's working in all things and, and he's working all things for the good of those who love him. So I then looked back on what had been a difficult year for myself. I, I, I recognize I'm, I'm a very privileged person. And the fact that, you know, there are so many difficult things that so many people are going through. Like, the, again, this, it, this doesn't really compare to so much. But as I looked back on it, I, I did see a very difficult year. But then I was able to see that actually through this, God was working for good. Because actually, even though he'd taken away these things, which I thought were important, suddenly I was then able to see the really important stuff. To be able to see that actually... It's knowing Jesus and, and knowing the cross. And what does that mean? And the things we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks that, um, you know, he, he, he had taken me from, a, a, from this place. And it's been like COVID, you know, like it's stripping it away and then showing me what really was important. And then through it all, I was just able to say, wow, wow, this is, you know, God, you are pretty cool. He's a pretty cool guy. And as we talk about evidence tonight, there's, if whenever you ask Christian, why they're Christian? They'll, they'll give you a, two sides of a coin. They're going to give you the, the personal reason and they're going to give you the intellectual reason. And, and it's normally the two that complement each other that really get you over the line or whatever. So I would ask, please, would you would you consider my personal story? 
Uh, would you consider the personal stories of the people that have come over the last four weeks? Because we really do believe this is real. You know, I have other things I could be doing on my Monday night. This isn't a nice idea or a philosophy or a comfort blanket or a crutch. No, this is, I'm here because I think this is real, like real. So please, would you consider this? And I also ask, please, would you consider then the intellectual side as, as Becca comes on after me and, and lays out some of the aspects of why we actually, we're, uh, as, as an intellect, as a, I study science, that I can stand by this as, as a logical sense as to why I believe Jesus was real and why I believe he rose from the dead. So thank you. Thank you for listening. Uh, and I just, I just ask, you know, you, you, can, you can reject it, but I just pray, I ask, would you consider it? So thank you very much. And I'll pass on now. Thank you very much, Isaac. Thank you for that. And I hope you guys out there enjoyed that. Yeah, Isaac picked up on something there that, in and of themselves, I think Rebecca is about to pick up on this too. In and of itself, Isaac being a Christian maybe doesn't seem like that big of a deal. But when you think that he's a Christian, that Steve's a Christian, I'm a Christian, that Rebecca is about to speak as a Christian, you know, I think all these things add together. And I think you're going to really see that come through in this talk. So thank you very much, Isaac. I'm going to ask Rebecca now to I'll just spotlight you here. Rebecca, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? And again, once you've done that, will you go straight into your talk? Yeah, absolutely. Um, hey, guys, um, my name is Rebecca. Um, and I'm currently a final year law student studying at Trinity College Dublin. Um, so yeah, let's just let's dive right in. Um, now, for any suit fanatics or law nerds alike, you will, that, you will know that in order for someone to be charged for murder, the prosecution must satisfy a burden of proof that the person who committed the murder did this beyond reasonable doubt. Tonight, I'm seeking to prove to you beyond reasonable doubt that Jesus Christ truly was the son of God. So let's get started. So miracles. Guys, here lies one of the first great claims about Jesus, that he was a miracle worker. Now, no other figure in all of history has been so widely believed to perform miracles. No one. And all of Jesus's followers proclaim this remarkable fact. Jesus Christ was a miracle worker. But perhaps more interesting of all is that even Jesus's enemies agree that he performed miracles. For example, we know of a document called the Babylonian Talmud now, this was written by Orthodox Jews around the time of Jesus, who hated the new Christian movement and tried to discredit it. And in order to do so, the Talmud basically says, yes, you're with Jesus, he performed miracles, but they were by the power of the devil. They were dark magic. Now, I, <laughs> I think it's fair to say that they've slightly given the game away here because surely if Jesus's miracles were all made up, the easiest thing for his enemies to say would be, you're all being deceived. He never actually did any miracles. He's really not that great. But they don't say that. They're forced to agree that he did do amazing signs and wonders. And so they are left with no other way of explaining them. So what do we find? Everyone agrees Jesus performed miracles. His many, many followers and even his enemies. So as we dig into evidence, we find a miracle worker, but it doesn't stop there. In Jesus, we also find probably the greatest moral teacher that ever lived. Here is a man from a poverty stricken, largely illiter illiterate backwater of the Roman Empire. And yet from this man comes the greatest teaching of all time. You don't believe me? Well, well, how about this one? Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. A remarkable statement that is still used today and is clearly traced back to this historical figure, Jesus. We take this saying for granted now, but no one has ever had ever produced it before. Or for another example, Matthew 5, 38. You've heard it said that it was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. 
If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other cheek to them as well. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Turn the other cheek. Heard these before? Ever stop to think about the man who first taught them? I mean, we could go on and on. Have you read the story of the prodigal son or heard the Sermon on the Mount? He was the greatest teacher of all time, bar none. I wonder, can you quote Plato? Can you quote Socrates? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think you can. And I know for me, I certainly couldn't. But you can quote Jesus Christ. He was the greatest teacher ever. And yet, unlike all these other blokes, great as they were, Jesus probably received no formal education. And beyond, he's not even most famous for his teaching. I mean, for a start, we've talked about miracles and we've talked about his resurrection. And we're about to talk about his resurrection. So miracles, then teaching. The evidence is building up. This isn't wishful thinking. This is truth. But it doesn't stop there. And we're going to go on to talk about prophecy. Now, it is absolutely remarkable how accurately Jesus fulfills these Hebrew texts written between 600 and 1,500 years before his time. Now, just a quick point. Do remember that for prophecy to be effective, it needs to be predictive, not prescriptive. And so what do I mean by that? Well, you couldn't have an Old Testament prophecy, prophecy saying, in 30 AD, in the blue building in Galilee, at 2 p.m., 2 p.m., a man is going to say, I am the saviour. Because all that would happen is in 30 AD at 2 p.m. in the Blue Building in Galilee, you get some absolute chancers rocking up and saying, I'm the saviour. Do you see the point? Instead, there does need to be a certain vagueness to prophecy so that you don't, don't get numerous people actively going out of their way to fulfil it. That's why when we peer into the Old Testament prophecy with a genuine attention to detail, we find something absolutely remarkable. So I'm first going to turn to the Joel prophecy where it says, the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is taken from a book called Joel, written many years before Jesus. And it's significant because it seems to be using the language of a solar eclipse. In fact, many other ancient documents speak of lunar eclipses in this way. But you might be thinking, well, why is this significant? Well, in 1990, enter Sir Humphrey, or Sir Colin Humphreys, a professor of physics at Cambridge University. Now, being an astron astronomer, Humphreys worked on a groundbreaking method to accurately date all the lunar eclipses that have happened throughout history in the in the area around the Middle East. And what did he find? There was a lunar eclipse across the Middle East on Friday, April the 3rd, 33 AD, between 620 and 710, the very date that Jesus Christ was crucified. So when you hear Joel, hundreds of years beforehand, saying the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. And when you hear all the biblical writers saying, yes, the sky went black as Jesus died on, the, on that cross. I hope you begin to realize something remarkable, that this man, Jesus Christ, fulfilled prophecy in a way that no other historical figure ever has. And of course, it's not just Joel, the Joel text is just one small drop in the ocean. In fact, I could probably spend hours talking to you about how Jesus fulfills prophecy, um, but I can imagine that our number of participants on Zoom would, would quickly decrease. Um, so I'll share with you what has been the most striking example for me. In Isaiah 53, it talks about a divine character who will one day die for his people specifically for the sins of his people, but will then live again. But get this, it does not just say he will die. It is much more specific than that. If you'll look with me, it says, he was pierced for our transgressions. 
He was crushed for our inequities and the punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds, we are healed. It says he was pierced for our sins and Jesus would go on to have his hands pierced. 300 years before the Carthaginians have invented crucifixion and here is Isaiah saying, the suffering servant will be pierced for us. And again, there are many, many more. So at the start, I put it to you that Jesus Christ truly was the son of God and that the evidence we would discuss today would satisfy this burden of beyond reasonable doubt. There is so much evidence that Jesus Christ performed before miracles, immeasurably more than any other historical figure ever. This, th then this same man probably produced the greatest moral teaching anyone has ever delivered but it doesn't stop there. Because it wasn't a coincidence that Jesus Christ performed miracles and taught with divine authority. It was all predicted in advance. Jesus Christ of Nazareth fulfilled pro prophecy in a way that no other historical figure ever has. Miracles, teaching, prophecy. You can see why billions of people throughout history have called him Lord and Savior. This isn't wishful thinking. This is true. And guess what? We haven't even spoken about the resurrection yet. Miracles, teaching, prophecy. Well, that man did all, who did all this died on a cross. And do be assured that Jesus Christ died on a cross is probably the most incontrovertible fact in ancient history. People may not like Jesus, People may want to discredit Jesus, but no reasonable historian in any decent academic institution would claim that Jesus Christ wasn't crucified. So the greatest miracle worker, the greatest teacher, the greatest fulfiller of prophecy dies on a cross. It shouldn't be a surprise what happens next. He rises from the dead. So now we're gonna to turn to look at the evidence for the resurrection. Where to begin? And again, much like the other three points, I could go on and on through evidence after evidence, but I won't on one condition, that you don't mistake shortage of time for shortage of evidence. So a quick highlights to her. Well, there's many arguments for the truth of the resurrection, but one particularly telling argument arises when we ask, where did the body go? Now, no one who was simply apathetic to Jesus's cause would have gone through the extreme lengths of stealing and then concealing this desperately sought after body. So that leaves us with two options. Either Jesus's followers took it or Jesus's enemies took it. But we know his enemies couldn't have stolen and hidden the body because they then spent the next century appalled and disgusted by the new Christian movement and desperately trying to discredit it. The Jewish establishment hated Jesus because he revolutionized their Orthodox religion. So if they had organized the stealing of the body, then they would simply have to produce it, but they were never able to do so. And then the political establishment, i.e. the Romans, they hated the Christians because of their subversive beliefs that Christ was greater than Caesar. So if they had stolen the body, they also would have just had to simply produce it and put, it, put an end to what they considered a dangerous myth. But they could never produce a body. So his enemies didn't steal and conceal his body. Well, then what about Christ's earliest followers? Maybe they took it. Maybe, maybe we're onto something here. Well, of course they didn't, because the early Christian movement was one of the most persecuted religious movements of all time. Indeed, many, in fact, most of Jesus's earliest and closest followers were martyred because they were convinced that Christ had risen. Why would they do that if they had the body? I mean, why would you put yourself through a painful death if you had the body there? Why would you die for a myth you knew you had created? And again, be assured, the resurrection of Jesus wasn't an idea that developed over time as eyewitnesses began to die off. No, no, quite the opposite. 
It was the first key principle of the earliest Christians. It is the centerpiece of all the literature produced in the first few decades after Christ's death. So who took the body? No one took the body. Because as the women in Mark 16 are told outside his tomb, he is risen. He's not there. And let me touch on that because that's another great piece of evidence. Have you noticed how the first people who find the empty tomb in all gospel accounts are women? Now, quite disgracefully in the Roman world, like it or not, women were not allowed a voice in court. In the Greco-Roman world, their word can be relied upon. Now, do remember that Jesus is spectacularly countercultural in his confrontation of a misogynistic culture in first century Judea. But that's an interesting topic for another day. The reason I make the point is because if Jesus' first followers were fabricating the story of his resurrection, then it would be a ludicrous error to describe women as the first people to have found the empty tomb. That would make it easily dismissible. And yet, that's exactly what they do. Why? Why would they do that? Because the resurrection isn't wishful thinking. It's true. When we look at the New Testament writers, when we look at the early church, we find a radical body of people who en masse are completely convinced of the historical fact of the resurrection. resurrection. And en masse suffered, en masse they suffered for it in brutal ways. Because the more you read the New Testament, the more you'll see that this is not wishful thinking. This is true. So we've done miracles, teaching, prophecy, resurrection. The body of evidence is too big to ignore. Now the final uh, piece of evidence we're gonna be looking at tonight is the growth of the early church. So now remember myths, develop over a long period of time. And they begin to develop most quickly once a potent, any potential eyewitnesses have died off. So for example, that's what we see when we look at the old English myth of Beowulf. After 300, 400 years, the idea that he slayed the monster Grendel begins to take shape. But this is not what happened with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Instantly, the early church begins to grow and it grows rapidly. And all these early believers proclaim the same key belief that this man, Jesus, came back to life. So the fifth key bit of evidence, the growth of the early church, the most spectacular religious explosion in history, the message of the resurrection spread like wildfire through the Roman world, carried on by the same people likely to have been eyewitnesses. And isn't that exactly what you would expect to see if the resurrection is true? The early church had no military, no economic power, no political power, but that didn't matter. But why did it not matter? Because they had the power of truth. The truth of the most remarkable event of all time. Now, just to prove how quickly the early church grew, here's a passage from the famous Roman historian Tacitus. Now, Tacitus is writing about the fire of Rome in 64 AD. And what he says is that Emperor Nero blamed the fire on the early Christians in order to try and stamp out their subversive movement. And here's what he says. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, from which the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate, and a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for a moment, again broke out and not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their centre and become popular. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty. Then, upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city as of hatred against mankind. Interesting, isn't it? 
Interesting how much Decetus knew already about Christians, that they followed Christ, a man crucified by Pontius Pilate. But more interesting that within 30 years of Jesus, the early church had grown so much that Nero blames the great fire of Rome on them as an attempt to get rid of them. Guys, at the start, I posed you with an evidentiary burden that I would be able to prove beyond reasonable doubt that Jesus truly is the son of God. Well, now look at the evidence, miracles, teaching, prophecy, resurrection, the growth of the early church. To add on this, we heard the personal story of Isaac who spoke about this truth and his belief in who Jesus is and how it has affected his whole life. So now it's up to you, the jury, to decide. Can you dispel this evidentiary burden of proof? What does the name Jesus mean to you? And with that, I rest my case. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for that talk. The evidence is out there. Um, and, I, I, and this now is the opportunity for you guys to, to query the, the evidence, I guess, as the jury in this trial. What, what did you think of it? What did you think of the, the points Rebecca brought up? What did you think of the points Isaac brought up? Well, we're going to open the floor to you. Please do get your questions in. You, you can pop them into the Zoom chat if you feel comfortable with that, or please do keep them coming into that Slido account.